uh, the LISC program in Indianapolis. And uh, when I saw that giant chunk of beef come out on the plate at lunch, I was a little disheartened by having to compete with the after effects of that right now. So I, uh, hopefully you will all uh, be energized by what we have to say and overcome that. So thank you for, very much for selecting the, to hear about Indianapolis. Um, really the story we're going to tell uh, this afternoon is about how through um, the adoption of a more comprehensive sustainable communities approach to community development in Indianapolis, We've really revitalized um, our work and actually ended up in a position where, as we look at the future of our city, the work of community development and, the, and grassroots organizations that are the backbone of that are critical to the success of our city in the future. And that's an exciting position to be in. Uh, this is going to, we're going to illustrate the fact that uh, we are, uh, of what is happening at the neighborhood level, which is obviously where all the action is. Um, by talking about one particular neighborhood. And one thing I want to emphasize is that there are, um, there are five neighborhoods, um, soon to be six neighborhoods, where we are focusing our, with our Sustainable Communities Initiative, and there are great things happening in all of those neighborhoods, but today we're going to talk about one in particular, and that is the Near East Side. And this is an area that you're going to hear more about, but um, it has, it's sort of a unique opportunity to support grassroots efforts with a broader civic partnership, and we're excited to talk to you about that. Um, I have the privilege of having three folks join me for this panel who have been uh, really critical to the success of, of this initiative on the Near East Side. Um, the first person on my right is Sarah Van Slambrook. Sarah is a senior program officer with LISC. She was the uh, program officer who worked very closely uh, with, with um, forming our sustainable communities, what we call Great Indy Neighborhoods Initiative work in Indianapolis, um, is really very, very um, uh, wise in the ways of comprehensive community development in, a, in, ju in just a few years. So um, I, if, she's a great resource uh, for this work and was the program officer that worked directly with uh, the Near East Side throughout this process. Um, we also have Tony Mason, um, uh, and Tony is the uh, executive vice president of the Indianapolis Super Bowl host committee for 2012 Super Bowl. Um, knock on wood, that will be occurring uh, in 2012. Um, the, in, in our city, we're very excited about that. And we're also excited, really, that, to see the partnership that is just really was sort of unexpected and exciting and has, has really paid great dividends. And Tony has played a critical role in, as, as one of the leaders of the uh, host committee in the work on the Near East Side. And then Joe Bowling, who is a community builder with the John Bonner Community Center. Um, Joe uh, has been, is a longtime neighborhood resident who stepped up to become staff for this initiative uh, at, the, at the community center, which is the convening organization for the work, and uh, has, has become the go-to guy to talk about what does that work of being a community builder look like, and, uh, and just has a tremendous amount of passion that you'll hear about for his community and the people there and what's, what's been able to happen there. So the approach we're going to talk about really today is a kind of a past, present, and future approach of our work. And we're going to start out with just looking a little bit of the background of how we got to where we are today. It's 2011, and Super Bowl 45 is in the books. The Green Bay Packers are world champions. Advertisers spent $3 million per 30-second spot, and consumers spent more than $10 billion on goods and services related to the game and the events surrounding it. In Indianapolis, we watched with special interest, because next year, in 2012, all eyes will be on our city as we host Super Bowl 46. And a lot of those eyes will be looking at what, less than a decade ago, was one of the most troubled neighborhoods in our city. Who would ever have thought that a little program spearheaded and overseen by LISC Indianapolis would have become an important part of one of the biggest annual events in the world? But that's exactly what happened. In 2006, LISC worked with the City of Indianapolis and other neighborhood organizations to develop GINI, the Great Indy Neighborhoods Initiatives. Ginny's goal was to help turn around Indianapolis's urban neighborhoods using 11 principles of comprehensive community development. 
rather than impose change from the top down, Ginny's philosophy was to engage neighbors at a grassroots level to create lasting change from the bottom up. Through Ginny, Lisk worked with neighborhoods that were ready for change by helping neighbors envision what they wanted to become, then create quality of life plans to serve as roadmaps for their future. We are a community that is blessed with a lot of resources, but we haven't been coordinating those resources at, at the scale that Ginny was able to do. I really, really credit Local Initiative Support Corporation with being willing to take that step and say, we're going to think big about this, and we're going to think big about how all these resources that are here, how can we take them, harness them into a, a commonly shared goal? And, and implement this broadly across the community in different kinds of neighborhoods. The Ginny Demonstration Initiative worked with six neighborhoods to develop quality of life plans, including the Near East Side neighborhood centered around the East 10th Street corridor into and out of downtown. The Near East Side had a well-deserved reputation as one of the city's roughest neighborhoods. For decades, it had been plagued with problems the collapse of key neighborhood institutions, the loss of homeowners, the nation's highest foreclosure concentration, vacant homes and storefronts, and rising crime rates, to name a few. But neighbors rallied to develop a vision of what they wanted their neighborhood to become. They worked with LISC to secure funding to help launch important neighborhood improvement projects. Around the same time, Indianapolis city officials were looking for ways to make their case to the National Football League to bring a Super Bowl to Indianapolis. We at LISC had a bold idea. Why not use the big game as a way to create a lasting legacy in one of our city's great urban neighborhoods? The Super Bowl bid committee eventually adopted the Near East Side Quality of Life Plan as its legacy project. NFL officials were impressed. Commissioner Roger Goodell said he and the owners were won over by our city's plan to use the Super Bowl to rebuild the Near East Side. It's one of the biggest projects ever undertaken in Indianapolis neighborhood development. And it all started with LISC helping neighbors harness the power to help themselves. Good afternoon. As Bill mentioned earlier, uh, this first section really talks about the past. What, what have we done over the last uh, five years or so? And I wanted to start off by telling you a little bit about a few things that we learned uh, from that past. One of the things, and many of you LISC staff um, will recognize this right away too, is that the important role that LISC plays as a convener, as a, a, um, a bridge builder to bring stakeholders together um, in neighborhoods, but also across the city. The video mentioned that we, um, that Great Indian Neighborhoods began in 2006, but really it began back in 2003 when community development corporations, the city of Indianapolis, LISC, and several other stakeholders came together to really think about how Indianapolis um, could be different in terms of its support of community development. What is the future of community development and support for neighborhoods in our city? Uh, there was a community development summit where 400 people came together in um, 2004 and then there was two years of hard work by a steering committee of about 40 folks from the private public nonprofit sector to talk about what are different models that are happening across the country what's happening already in our city that's really going well and how can we build upon that and it was a key time to to get buy-in from funders, from city officials, from neighborhoods to really think about how they could do things differently and how they could do things even better than they were doing um, even greater in terms <laughs> of great neighborhoods. Uh, and so there was a lot of convening and bridge building that happened um, for years before great Indian neighborhoods was introduced. And I think that that was uh, really to our benefit in terms of being able to have um, wide buy-in and moving forward with that. At the neighborhood level, there was also um, a lot of work that went into um, becoming a great indie neighborhood, um, being selected to participate in that, but also being ready as a neighborhood to take on the things that go into quality of life planning and implementation, um, things like being able to work collaboratively, having um, residents really truly engaged in the work of the neighborhood, and having a vision um, for the neighborhood plan. The Near East Side 
was really at a point in time of a, of a perfect storm of being ready um, at the time that Great Indian Neighborhoods came about. They had been working for a few years at that time as their Near East Side Collaborative Task Force, which was an open table um, for all folks that were um, a part of the neighborhood, residents, business owners, um, funders sitting side by side, talking about where the Near East Side needs to go, um, talking through old issues, old wounds, trying to, to move past that and, and br building bridges and um, really advocating for themselves as a neighborhood. Um, one of the early wins that the Near East Side encountered was um, 46201, the zip code on the Near East Side, was the, had the highest foreclosure, foreclosure rate in the country at that time. And that was before the foreclosure crisis. <laughs> and um, they advocated to the city um, to, to get some more resources, to get some more attention. And over time, that really had an impact. It was happening at the same time that Great Indian Neighborhoods was taking shape before neighborhoods had been selected. And the city decided that part of its commitment to Great Indian Neighborhoods was to really think about using tax increment financing in a new and different way. And the Near East Side was selected as the, the first neighborhood um, to, to use that. And they have a housing tax increment financing district that has um, put a lot of investment um, dollars on the streets there and infrastructure to um, improve the neighborhood and has really fit in with a lot of their priorities and their quality of life plan. So the, the groundwork at the citywide level and the groundwork in the neighborhood was vitally important to get buy-in, to be able to, to implement um, into the future. Uh, Joe's going to talk to you a little bit more about how all, the, all of that took shape. Um, in particular, the quality of life planning process that many of you have probably heard about because LISC, LISC has been using this model um, across all different cities. But you know, the community engagement um, before planning even began, doing quality of life planning over a period of time where you really map out um, who's doing what and by what timeline and holding each other accountable for that. And then thinking about how to implement that and, and get um, resources within and outside of the neighborhood. Thanks. Well, as Sarah mentioned, uh, we started pulling together um, neighborhood residents, including myself and others, uh, together as early as 2006 to really start to talk about um, the, the, what was becoming overwhelming evidence that we as a neighborhood were in some pretty serious trouble. Um, we had received a, a couple different wake-up calls. We had a real tragedy in our neighborhood where a family was, was murdered in their home uh, that had become a pretty high-profile event. We had lost a couple grocery stores in sort of one fell swoop. And just there was this mounting evidence that some things were going to have to give, and it was, it was getting more and more difficult. Um, again, this is a community of about 35,000 people in 20 small neighborhoods, and this group started to meet together monthly, and there was really widespread agreement uh, around that task force that, uh, that the challenges were pretty immense, um, that no one organization in our neighborhood was really equipped, was really looking at these things kind of comprehensively. Uh, third, um, that each of our work as residents or as neighborhood-based organizations would be much more effective if we collaborate. And then probably a fourth thing that we had agreement on was we had no idea how to address this. <laughs> we, know, we knew that we should keep meeting, we knew that we should collaborate, um, but there was really just not that sort of vehicle or tool or structure uh, created to help us kind of get at some of what we knew um, were some of our issues. Um, as Sarah mentioned, we had been working with the city on creating a TIF district, which was great. Um, it's a good tool, but it really wasn't going to get at the complexity and the challenges that we saw just on our streets, um, sort of in, in the way that we knew we needed. Uh, we did become one of the six uh, Great Indy Neighborhoods initiatives. We found out about that initiative. The more we found out about it, the more we liked it. We applied. We were accepted. Um, and um, and that, was a, that was a great time for us to, to finally feel like we kind of had a tool um, that would help us kind of move forward. Um, our local steering committee, that task force that had been meeting, became um, kind of the, uh, the steering committee at the neighborhood level. Um, and then we really started to look at what effective strategies would be to engage more of our neighbors and then to go into this sort of quality of life planning process um, in a way that's, uh, that, that would get us that sort of comprehensive <coughs> plan that we needed. Um, I'll mention uh, just a few highlights from our planning process. Um, one of the things that we discovered very early on as we started to meet with key neighborhood leaders 
was just some of those past hurts and, and disappointments and bitterness. Um, those were pretty deep and they were pretty real. I mean, there was a lot of skepticism that anything would change in our neighborhood at all. Um, as we started to meet with people, you know, we used appreciative inquiry techniques to try and focus uh, folks on the positive and the possibilities. Um, and even in spite of some of those things, which were certainly effective, uh, we heard over and over again, things will never change. The city is written off this side of town a long time ago. Um, and any sort of uh, improvements that we make, um, they'll just sort of be undone in a, in a couple years because um, just we, we can't support it. Um, so that was that was difficult to overcome. One of the um, as a as a sign of one of the things that we did at the very beginning of our planning process, uh, we really brought folks together. We tried to change the dynamic of the the sort of neighborhood uh, meetings and, and make it a more positive culture. But one of the things that we did was just a very simple forgiveness exercise at the very start of the planning process when we brought neighbors together for our kickoff meeting. Um, where we literally just said from the microphone, um, we're going to be positive, we're going to envision a, a good future for our neighborhood, and, and we want each and every one of you, you know, to be able to accept that. And whatever it is that's holding you back from envisioning that positive future, um, write it on a scrap of paper. We're going to give everybody about five minutes, write it down. Um, and then we're going to crumple it up and we all threw it in kind of a waste paper basket and we said we're going to move forward we're going to make this positive we are not going to let this opportunity become kind of a neighborhood gripe session and kind of devolve into something we don't want it to be and so that was an important time for us uh, secondly we wanted to design a format that would be really engaging for frankly just a lot of regular low-income folks that don't know about planning um, but uh, don't normally come to neighborhood meetings. So we wanted a strategy that would be engaging, that would keep people uh, having a positive experience to keep them coming back. We utilized, and, and others of you have probably utilized this too, but an open space or open source um, kind of techniques for, for doing things. Um, so as neighbors would come into our planning meetings, particularly our kickoff meeting, uh, we gave those, those folks kind of a comment card or a cue card, index card that they could write on the index card sort of what they would like the group to talk about together. Um, we did that for everyone that came in. We got about 90 of those back, um, and we had about 90 conversations that day and three rounds of 30 conversations apiece um, of, of folks saying, I want to talk about you know, youth athletics in the neighborhood. Okay, that becomes a table topic. We projected each of them in sort of uh, three rounds up onto a big screen and then folks could choose which uh, topic they wanted to go and be a part of. Um, so neighbors chose the agenda, the conversations that we'd have. Uh, neighbors then choose which of those 30 um, conversations that they wanted to be part of. And then thirdly, if you didn't like the conversation, you could get up at any point in time and go to the next one. Um, you, know, you guys probably have that choice here. You can go see Rhode Island or, uh, or whatever. <laughs> if, if I just keep babbling. But we gave folks that opportunity that we wanted them to find a place where they could kind of give their contribution. Um, and if they didn't feel like that was happening where they were, they could get up and move. Um, and that really gave us a sense of what the neighborhood was ready to work on. Um, the perceived things that we should address in our plan um, drug dealing, prostitution, abandoned housing, um, weren't as high priority for a lot of our neighbors as maybe some other things. And we, we got to gauge uh, what people wanted to talk about. We knew those things were the things that we could really probably have some success um, on. And then, um, and then uh, kind of a final thing in our planning process, we tried to eliminate all those different barriers that keep people from participating. And so, I mean, for a bunch of these things, we, we did transportation. I mean, we literally picked people up and brought them to meetings and took them home if they wanted to participate. Uh, we had childcare, um, translators for a lot of our Latino Spanish speaking neighbors. Um, I mean, you name it. We did that certainly because we wanted those um, thoughts and opinions from those resident experts, but we really, really wanted to protect sort of their investment in the process. We didn't want folks who did not choose to participate to kind of uh, call into question the authenticity or legitimacy of, of this work and say, well, I never heard about it or, well, I never you know, got invited. I mean, 
If you lived in our neighborhood, you knew about this. Three people had knocked on your door. It's on a billboard where you drive past every day. You knew about it, and there was every opportunity for you to be a part. And I think that was an important part of just telling folks, we want you to be a part of this. Um, I go into a lot of that detail just to say the organizing and planning work that we did as a neighborhood was so, so critical. Um, to the work that, that you're going to hear a little bit more about. The $100 million of investment in our neighborhood, um, we were ready for it, we were organized, we were engaged, and I think we were, we were so because of the Great Indy Neighborhood's sort of vehicle and, and structure uh, that we were given. One of the things that is kind of a funny quip about the Quality of Life Plan, as, as Joe and the neighborhood finished that up and they submitted the first draft to LISC to, you know, to, to look at. Um, our first point of feedback was, wow, 150 different objectives. This is pretty <laughs> ambitious. I'm not so sure about that. And you'll see, pretty ambitious is really an understatement um, for the Near East Side. You'll get to hear a little bit more about that. The NFL's Legacy Project is a unique local benefit of hosting a Super Bowl and no city has capitalized on the opportunity quite like Indianapolis. Indianapolis is leveraging this national spotlight for long-term community transformation. It all started with neighborhood quality of life plans developed under the auspices of LISC, one of which outlined a detailed plan for the revitalization of the city's struggling Near East Side. Thanks to this plan, which was fleshed out by hundreds of passionate Near East Side residents, the groundwork for transformative change had already been laid. By partnering with LISC, the Super Bowl Bid Committee aligned itself with a legacy project uniquely positioned for long-term success. Super Bowl Bid Committee Chairman Mark Miles made the Near East Side revitalization a key part of his Super Bowl pitch. And the rest, as they say, is history. The, the effort to redevelop the Near East Side neighborhood is, uh, has been going on for a very long time, long before Indianapolis was a candidate or, or actually the host uh, for the Super Bowl in 2012. So we had a big running start. Uh, the most important thing to know about this project is that it really is the broader community and the Super Bowl host committee trying to help the leadership of the neighborhood, the residents of the neighborhood, pursue their own vision, their own plan. And uh, that's, uh, as I said, work that's been going on for a long time. We've been at it as partners uh, for about two and a half, three years, and I couldn't be more pleased uh, with, with the progress that's been made so far. Uh, a lot of this was aspirational when we started, and it was very unclear how much really would be accomplished, but today, we uh, believe it's going to be the case that almost a hundred million dollars will have been pulled together for the various aspects of the redevelopment of the Near East Side, and we're really very proud of that. Already, a new future is beginning to take shape in the Near East Side neighborhood. A new home ownership incubator, located at Jefferson Apartments, just opened on May 10, 2010. Consisting of 18 rental units and two condominiums, residents attend home ownership classes while living in the building. And last December saw the opening of Pogue's Run, Indianapolis's first retail food co-op. The member-owned grocery filled a critical void in a neighborhood where grocery store closings had been the norm in recent years. Now Near East Side families can shop for nutritious, locally grown fruits, vegetables, and meat, all without leaving the neighborhood. Thanks to a $1 million contribution from J.P. Morgan Chase, new market tax credits from LISC, and generous local grants, the Chase Near East Side Legacy Center is now under construction. Scheduled to open at the end of 2011, the community center will be located on the campus of Indianapolis Arsenal Technical High School. It will house a greenhouse, educational gardens, and a fitness center, providing neighborhood residents access to important wellness and recreational programs. In the Englewood neighborhood, former Indianapolis Public School No. 3 is being transformed into the Commonwealth, a 32-unit multifamily apartment building for low-income families. 
two other former public schools, both recently at risk of demolition, will now serve as important hubs for the Indianapolis Metropolitan Police and the Indianapolis Fire Department. Change is coming to the St. Clair neighborhood, where the St. Clair Place Home Ownership Project is addressing the area's alarmingly low ownership rates and high foreclosure concentration. By offering homes at various price points through the Neighborhood Stabilization Program, the project is attracting homeowners of various social and economic backgrounds. Meanwhile, the new St. Clair Senior Apartments will provide affordable living accommodations for the elderly, as well as 3,600 square feet of new retail and office space. Across the street, the new People's Health Center will give families in the neighborhood critical access to health care. And thanks to the Metropolitan Indianapolis Board of Realtors, the MyBor Centennial Project will help renovate and build 32 homes, all of which will be rented to homeless families or families at risk of being homeless. Change is also coming to the corner of East 10th and Oakland Streets, where plans are underway to develop a 49,000 square foot mixed use building to be known as Clifford Corners. And with the help of Rebuilding Together Indianapolis, more than 50 low income homeowners in the neighborhood will receive crucial repairs that will keep their homes safe and livable all year long. Rebuilding, after all, is what the Super Bowl Legacy Project is all about. Several community organizations, including the John H. Bonner Community Center and dozens of others, are helping it happen. And though LISC facilitated the quality of life plan that served as the blueprint for this neighborhood transformation, the most important ingredient has been the passion and commitment of Near East Side residents. I've been in the neighborhood about 30 years. I've you know, stayed involved as much as I can with my own neighborhood, and um, we've done a lot of uh, improvements over there. It's been fun to watch that grow and happen. We just see it, it's our time. I think that's probably what we're reveling in most of all, is that we're finally being lifted up um, with help from others as well as uh, ourselves, and that's a good feeling. Their neighborhood pride fueled this project, and their hard work will leave a legacy that will last for decades, even centuries to come. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to start out by uh, congratulating each and every one of you. LISC is an organization for 30 years of engaging community organizations and residents and civic leaders in the process of building sustainable communities. I'd also like to congratulate Mr. Taft and Indianapolis LISC for the success that's, that's being enjoyed all across our community. Uh, you heard him mention five, six neighborhoods, quality of life plans, and you saw this wonderful presentation about Indianapolis's near east side and all that's being accomplished there. So congratulations to you, Bill, your staff, and they do deserve a big round of applause. Mr. Taft's a pretty smart man. He, too, he made two extremely uh, timely smart phone calls. The, the, the second one was actually inviting me to be here today because honestly, I can tell you, we, at least as staff members, we get out once or twice a week making presentations. So we love talking about the Super Bowl effort in Indianapolis. And uh, I can tell you it's an honor to be here and it's most cer certainly an upgrade over being at the pancake house this morning talking to a small group. <laughs> So I thank you for that, Bill. Uh, but also, I'll tell you about the second call that he made that truly impacted uh, this overall effort that we call the Legacy Project. To understand LISC, the Indianapolis Super Bowl Host Committee, pro Host Committee, as well as the Legacy Project, you have to go back to the Super Bowl bid process itself. A little bit about that. We spent over a year actually developing the bid proposal and presentation. Uh, the end result being two three-inch binders with hundreds of pages of details about how Indianapolis would plan and execute the Super Bowl. Additionally, what you need to know, the audience for that presentation, if you will, is a very small, unique, special audience. It's the 32 owners of the NFL teams or franchises. Simply put, you have to sell them on how and why your community can successfully stage a Super Bowl. Regardless of how big your local organizing committee is, 
They only allow five individuals to represent your community in that room, and they only allow two people to speak, and you have a grand total of 15 minutes to briefly and concisely share how you will successfully stage the event. You know, we, unfortunately, we came up two votes short in our bid to secure the 2011 game. And that was quite ironic because we had a wonderful presentation and we had a great, a great closer of that presentation. Former uh, Colts head coach, Tony Dungy. And I can tell you before that presentation, Coach Dungy was sweating profusely, more profusely than ever. And ever seeing him on the sideline, whether it was preseason or against the Patriots. I mean, he was sweating profusely because he understood the importance of that bid for our community and what it would mean for revitalization efforts or perhaps having a broader impact uh, upon the community for decades to come. And so with that, what I can tell you, we came up two votes short. North Texas, 17, Indianapolis, 15. Only two vo votes short and their stadium can hold over 100,000 people. And believe it or not, and I'll say this to the guys, and I'm not trying to be sexist up in here with a scoreboard that a guy would die to have in his family room or in his man cave. It really does span from one 20-yard line to the other. And so it's a sight to behold. But that being said, newly elected Mayor Greg Ballard in 2007 uh, reapproached our, our organizing committee and said, you know what, let's give it another shot. Let's give it another shot. And with that, it, it allowed us the opportunity to rethink our purpose as a host committee and also to think about how we could have a, have a more substantial impact for the community as a whole. So with that, the first goal we established was that we would exceed the NFL's expectations. And that if we raise the bar for our goals to have a positive impact upon the community, we would far exceed anything they could ever expect. And additionally, what it allowed us the opportunity to do was to consider how we could leverage the event for the greater good of our community, the long-term greater good. Far after that game is over, you know, we want to be able to look back and point at tangible progress in our community. And so with that, uh, the next phone call, ironically, <coughs> came in from Mr. Taft, or actually it was the first one. He suggested to Mark Miles, who you saw in the video, that uh, the host committee should consider adopting one of the neighborhood quality of life plans as the legacy project. And so with that, a lot of review was undertaken. Mr. Taft played a key role in that process along with his staff as well as uh, the various organizations around the community that were involved in that process. And so to that end, uh, what we advanced forward was something far beyond anyone could ever imagine, and especially the NFL. And so starting with the legacy project itself, the typical legacy being a $2 million investment in the renovations or a build out of a boys and girls club. Well, beyond that, it's the building of a 27,000 square foot, $11.2 million facility that you saw featured in the video. It's the Chase Neary Side Legacy Center, Indianapolis Youth Education Town. Uh, there will be over 13, uh, community organizations providing services and programs in that building, ensuring that it is sustainable over time. Uh, it also involved looking at uh, the housing redevelopment efforts. Typically with an NFL Super Bowl, uh, you will hear about the rebuilding together in Habitat for Humanity initiatives that normally touch somewhere in the area of maybe 30 to 40 homes. Well, it was adopting the housing redevelopment effort of the, the quality of life plan and looking at how we could positively impact over 200 single family housing units through either a complete new rebuild, new construction, or homeowner repair and renovations. And then of course, uh, you saw in the video some uh, reference to revitalization efforts on East 10th Street, commercial properties and things of that nature, streetscape infrastructure. And so going into the room with that sort of aspirations and goal was a real eye-opener for the NFL. Uh, one of the things we realized as a host committee is, you know, we're never going to have 100,000 seats inside of Lucas Oil Stadium. That's not our goal. Our goal really is to leverage the event for the greater good. Uh, also, it helped going into the room knowing that we had nearly $25 million in committed donations to support that effort. So we walked in with a plan that said, hey, we're going to execute your event. We're going to do a flawless job at it. 
but we're going to have this impact upon the uh, Indianapolis and central Indiana, and our state for that matter, that will be remembered for decades to come. To underscore that commitment to that effort, we engage 32 central Indiana eighth graders in the actual bid process. They were chosen by their district superintendents uh, to participate in that effort. They were trained and ultimately they experienced interviews with the media. They actually sat down, presented our bid packages to the owners in each NFL city. For some of them, just imagine that experience because some had never flown on a plane before. So they got to meet uh, you know, team owners, general managers, they got to tour facilities and in a lot of cases in places like Washington, D.C., uh, they got to experience some great tourist, uh, tourist attractions and things of that nature. Uh, those young people, they're still talking about that experience today. As for the formal bid presentation itself, Mark Miles, our chairman, was the opener. And to further underscore how important the legacy project effort was, we engaged Dr. Eugene White, who is the superintendent of Indianapolis Public Schools. He was the closer, and he underscored how much the housing efforts, the building of the Yet Center on Arsenal Tech High School's campus, which is an Indianapolis public school, and just how bringing the neighborhood forward would positively impact the young people. And that again, we're talking about our future leaders and, and probably people who will play key roles in LISP 30 years from now. <laughs> so uh, with that, he was a heck of a closer, and in the aftermath of it, uh, I recall him turning and looking at Coach Dungeon and says, you know, every now and then you have to bring in the big fellow to close the job. <laughs> so yes, we were able to secure the bid, and I can tell you that we are 319 days away. Uh, our plan is, you know, we're focused on February 12, 2012 as the day of the Super Bowl. But between now and then, you will continue to hear about all of the wonderful accomplishments and achievements. Uh, there are key partners, and our commitment is underscored by the fact that the host committee is funding the salaries of Joe Bowling, James Taylor, Tracy Heaton. They're all on the Bonner Center staff, which you saw referred to in the building. And so they are focused 24 hours a day, and I know Joe will probably acknowledge that, 24 hours a day on moving the quality of life plan and the the aspects of the legacy project forward. Uh, what has what also happened as a result of this wonderful marriage and relationship is the engagement of the broader corporate business community into the effort. And so when you look at our various committees that are involved with the legacy project, they are co-chaired by individuals who either reside or lead organizations in the neighborhood, but they're also combined with someone from the, bar, the broader business, corporate, or governmental community. So that way, uh, it's not a situation where this effort is, is viewed as some sort of a, a, a occupational takeover or some sort. It's everyone working together. And what we see forthcoming is that this will be a model, perhaps, for other efforts across our community in terms of the partnering with major civic events and things of that nature to move projects and neighborhoods forward. But we also see it becoming perhaps a national model of some sort that may be adopted uh, by the NFL in connection with Super Bowls. And so we're excited about what's happening in Indianapolis. We know the NFL is, and what I can tell you, organizations like the Bonner Center, Indy East Asset Development, which is the lead agency on housing. I know we have Pat Gamble Moore here, who is with INHP. That's the Indianapolis Neighborhood Housing Partnership. They're providing services and, and guidance for families moving towards home ownership. A, a number of organizations, East 10th Street Civic Association, uh, and, and the numerous community foundations and corporate sponsors that are coming into the community and embracing the effort. And again, we hope that, that everyone will continue to work together, not only on the Near East Side, but those other neighborhoods that require assistance and support moving forward. And so. I guess with that, I have probably said enough, and I need to turn the mic back over. <laughs> I'll just say real quickly, um, you know, where we are today on implementing our quality of life plan, I think I counted on the way down here. I think we have about a dozen, 12 or so uh, developments of over a million dollars that are 
under construction right now. Uh, this in a neighborhood that uh, for the last decade or so probably <coughs> hasn't had more than maybe one uh, development of that kind underway at any one time. So again, it's just it's a really incredible time uh, for us. But even sort of outside of just some of those larger things that are in our, in our quality of life plan, um, there's a lot of ways that this sort of partnership has really helped lift up, uh, as my friend Ann Hanlon said on the video, uh, lifting up a lot of our different initiatives and a lot of the, the kind of work that happens in neighborhoods with a lot of neighbors kind of toiling um, you know, without a lot of recognition from time to time. Uh, some of those small things, we've, we've been able to take, uh, have a program with our local theater and symphony uh, to take Near East Side kids to, uh, to, to the show or to a symphony. Um, uh, a partnership with Big Brothers, Big Sisters to focus their bigs and littles sort of more uh, on the Near East Side or tree plantings throughout the Near East Side to increase kind of the tree canopy. Again, nothing uh, too capital intensive, but, but still really a part of neighborhood quality of life. There's certainly been challenges. Um, with a partnership like this, um, there always are, and there are tensions that come up. Um, we've really tried for this work to be as sustainable as possible, looking toward the long-term health of our neighborhood and really trying to avoid the kind of extreme neighborhood makeover kind of mentality um, to kind of quick fixes into place. Um, and that's one of the things that I'll say that we've appreciated about the host committee and our partners as they have not tried to push us or steer us into anything that's sort of outside the scope of what our neighbors envisioned in that plan. And I think it's so important that we've had that plan where we can continually go back to it and say, here is what our neighbors felt like was most important for sort of neighborhood um, vitality. Um, meaningful engagement of civic and corporate leaders in the nitty gritty community development work is certainly always a challenge, um, but again, these are, um, these are good challenges, these are good opportunities for someone like Tony Mason, who's the senior vice president of the Super Bowl host committee, to even know about East 10th Street or St. Clair Place neighborhood is an incredible win. And so as we've strengthened those sort of neighborhood relationships, that web of relationships at the neighborhood level, we've really now extended those more sort of toward the region and to folks outside of the neighborhood, which has just made us a lot stronger. A few things happened during our quality of life planning or just right after that we couldn't have envisioned. We've had uh, the threat of a couple of our libraries closing or uh, the threat of a new um, work release center being sort of located uh, right smack dab in the middle of our neighborhood. Um, without this process, without this sort of neighborhood organizing and planning work that really kind of made us stronger and more resilient, I'm not sure how we would have sort of mobilized to be able to tackle some of those things. So we're much more prepared now for the challenges that'll be ahead and, and they will be ahead. Again, we haven't, um, um, we can't undo all of the things on the Near East Side over three years um, or in the next 319 days and, and we don't have any illusion that we will. Um, but again, we're more prepared now for the next 319 days uh, to work on some of these things because of these partnerships and frankly because of the entire Great Indy Neighborhoods Initiative. Joe mentioned that, that they go back to the plan continuously and it's every program officer's dream when I get reports from Joe, it talks about the investments that they've had and the projects that they're doing and next to it there's a column that has where it is in the quality of life plan because they are continuously chugging away at making sure that they're really following the neighborhood's vision. That's really powerful. But my reports are always three weeks late, she didn't mention that. <laughs> Twenty or thirty years from now, we're going to look back and say the East Side Legacy Project, which certainly was was catalyzed by Lisk, um, was the beginning of kind of the renaissance of the of the Near East Side of Indianapolis. The end of the Great Indy Neighborhoods Initiatives was only the beginning of the transformation Lisk is helping to spur in urban neighborhoods across the city. Lisk is still supporting five of the six former Ginny neighborhoods as Lisk's sustainable communities and working with one new neighborhood on Indianapolis's north side to develop its own quality of life plan. Our strategic plan for sustainable communities is based on three measurable outcomes. One, residents of core neighborhoods participate fully in the regional economy. 
We want to make sure residents of LISC sustainable communities have the skills and the support they need to support themselves in jobs and other activities based on opportunities available in central Indiana. So we're supporting Centers for Working Families that help the working poor get ahead. Charter schools that offer neighborhood alternatives for parents and students. Cultural and community events and other efforts to make neighborhood life better for people who live there. Two, core neighborhoods are attractive places to live, work, learn, and play. This requires a comprehensive approach to attracting a wide range of investments, not just improving housing, but also paying attention to community needs in education, safety, health, business, and other factors that make neighborhoods sustainable. Parks, retail, Walkable commercial districts where merchants want to locate, all contributing to improving neighborhoods where people want to live. Three, core neighborhoods are integrated into the regional economy. Sustainable communities should not only be places for people to live, they should also be places that contribute to the vitality of our region as a whole, with businesses and events that make our neighborhoods powerful contributors to the city's economy. We're working to help develop responsible, affordable transportation solutions and to support efforts to attract businesses and institutions that help our urban neighborhoods become destinations for others. LISC as an organization understands the linkages between infrastructure, housing, commercial development, and also the linkages between all the kinds of tools that we have, you know, uh, local, federal, state, uh, private, philanthropic, right? and they've been able to bring all of those things together on this new vision for the Near East Side. Urban neighborhoods are at a critical juncture uh, in this country in terms of moving forward or, or standing still, and I think that LISC has been very much on the forefront of helping them to move forward. Uh, locally, uh, since they've been here in 1992, um, I think they have been uh, a wonderful asset to what we see in the area of community development, and, and, and particularly around neighborhood development. Every city has to have big ambitions, bold ideas, a willingness to innovate. But they also have to have the confidence to go their own way. The worst thing we can ever do is try to copy other cities. I mean, we can look at their best practices and maybe adapt a best practice into you know, our vision for our city. But one of the best things a city can do is be distinctive, be unique, be, be its own authentic self. Lisk is a thought leader. LISC, uh, you know, I think brings back great national insight from its national office and its connectivity to these other cities. But I think we have to translate, and LISC is doing that, about how to make Indianapolis the best city it can be, playing our, on our own assets, our own strengths, and having the confidence to chart our own journey and our own path. Midwest Neighborhoods is bringing their own history and their own culture into the future. And allowing people to see the richness that they have, I think that attracts people all through the city. Residents, businesses, community organizations, schools, anyone that is interested and loves the city and wants to be closer to the city. Developing bold ideas. Translating them into action. Innovating in urban neighborhoods across Indianapolis helping developing neighborhoods become truly sustainable communities, helping emerging neighborhoods come together to develop quality of life plans of their own. That's what LISC is doing in Indianapolis today. We're helping Indianapolis chart its path by inspiring and leading our neighbors to chart paths of their own. It's remarkable to see what we're becoming together. This last section of the video really talks about uh, the future of Indianapolis and uh, LISC's role in it. And uh, Bill is going to talk to you a little bit about our strategic plan, which is a uh, new strategic plan which is being rolled out right now, 2011. Um, but before he goes there into that bigger picture, I wanted to talk to you just for a moment about what's happening next with the quality of life planning with um, that piece that we um, started, as I mentioned, back in, in 2003 and that has continued, how it has grown over time. 
Um, during Great New Neighborhoods, which ended in 2009, we had a large citywide steering committee that met and thought about these issues and, and helped advise us on how to move forward with it. Well, there are a number of folks that were sitting around that table that said, well, this is a conversation we want to continue. And it was really driven by that group to, um, to continue meetings. There is a quality of life advisory council that meets. And the goal is to figure out um, how to continue to incorporate this into business as usual, uh, that there's not a, a separate, another demonstration project or a, um, you know, another initiative or, or program that happens, but that this is the way that we do the work in Indianapolis. And so uh, it's other intermediaries, funders, neighborhoods um, that are talking about how we can help other neighborhoods undertake quality of life planning, how we can support them financially and also through technical support. Uh, and so there's really a great, vibrant conversation going on around that. Uh, additionally, uh, the video mentioned very briefly, uh, we're trying to, LISC is trying to um, learn from what happened in Great Indian Neighborhoods and take those lessons and try again. We are working um, with uh, another neighborhood, the Mid-North neighborhood, just um, just north of the central city. And um, right now, uh, on April 9th, actually, they're having their large scale visioning summit, a culmination of about six months worth of community organizing that's been going on. And um, really exciting to see some of the same things that we saw on the near east side, but a lot of different things too. It's a different neighborhood, there are different strengths and challenges. And again, continuing that learning process and sharing it um, around the table with other folks um, that LISC's, LISC is in partnership with. And then finally thinking about, so what happens after that? What, where's the next neighborhood or the next, the next work? Um, in Indianapolis right now, there is a large um, regional conversation around um, public transportation and a, um, a proposal on the table that is still being worked through um, around having light rail and bus rapid transit and a large scale investment um, in, in uh, the region. So one of the things that LISC is, is thinking about and helping neighborhoods think about is how can neighborhoods be prepared uh, for that investment when and if it does come through. Um, as we know, transportation or, um, transportation oriented design is uh, and development is is vital and it happens whether a neighborhood wants or is ready for it or not. And so the community organizing aspect of the quality of life planning and creating that neighborhood vision is really going to be important for those neighborhoods to think about, organize, um, envision and be prepared for those opportunities when they come along and so um, right now we're again at that convening and, and bridge building stage of, of talking with those on the transportation side talking um, to folks uh, state stakeholders in those neighborhoods to think about um, who might be involved and how we can um, we can support that effort so that's kind of the the next steps around quality of life planning and and that comprehensive community development from that micro scale and Bill's going to share a little bit more about the macro level and how we're dealing with that. Well, a lot of these presentations we talk about the positive things, but Indianapolis certainly has a lot of challenges as well. As a city, um, we have uh, a couple generations ago actually included what was the rest of the county within the city limits and captured a, gener a couple generations of sprawl to keep the neighbor the, the community healthy. but. What's happening now is we're starting to see this a lot of the same signs that other Midwestern uh, Rust Belt cities have experienced with the loss of traditional manufacturing base and with the depletion of home ownership in a lot of our old core neighborhoods. Uh, we have, um, we've lost more than half of the population of our center township uh, since 1960 and we have over 10,000 vacant houses. And what we've, uh, what we've realized uh, in sort of a frightening kind of way, I guess you'd say, for those of us who kind of worked at the neighborhood level, is that some of the largest challenges for our city going forward is what to do, how to harness the capacities and the energy of our city to actually bring our neighborhoods in the core neighborhoods back to life again and to adjust them to, to actually thrive within the realities of our markets going forward. And uh, that applies, as, as you saw in the video, that applies to individuals, helping individuals tap into that, helping the neighborhoods to be places where people will choose to invest in the future, whether that's living there or bringing their businesses, or whether that is um, in weaving our neighborhoods as critical components into our regional economy. And, and that larger piece of work is the solution for our city uh, for the success of Indianapolis going forward, and, and it depends on us 
as a community development field and this comprehensive approach to really make that happen. And, and it's suddenly um, pushing us into a level of, uh, of a critical path to the future of our city that we haven't really thought of ourselves in in the past. And so, uh, you know, I, again, I think this traditional community development work uh, or the, tradi the traditional way we did community development uh, was not equipped to play that role. But because of the partnerships at the neighborhood level, when you think about um, the, the, that sort of tightly woven fabric that Joe mentioned of, of, what's, of the people and institutions at the neighborhood level who now are working together and are used to working together and have a framework to work together, as well as these outside partnerships of, um, and particularly illustrated by the legacy initiative of the civic leadership in our city, local government, philanthropy, uh, all of those um, key partnerships are now formed up. They are at least in a nascent level. They are there in place that we can grow those going forward. Um, so there, we have realized that as we've done that, that there are some missing pieces. Um, that we have great grassroots organizations increasingly are working in terms of comprehensive community development around the city. And we also now have some great partnerships with uh, local government and, and philanthropy and other nonprofits. But there are also some missing pieces that we've realized we need to be able to take some of these responses to scale. Uh, and and this, this partnership is also responding to that. Um, and those are things like um, how do we use um, dollars when they come in an unusual way. And I think we're kind of learning from the experience we had with NSP funds um, that came, came over the last couple of years where we were able to focus most of those in our sustainable communities neighborhoods. That, but there are also other new opportunities arising. Um, we have uh, a growing partnership with our Workforce Investment Board. Uh, we're recognizing that there is a need for uh, re for um, reemployment for many people in our neighborhoods and trying to figure out ways to link that. Um, we have a particular uh, exciting opportunity right now to do that, which is something called Working for Green, a new nonprofit that's just getting started that will deconstruct over 360 houses out of a large push to demolish some of these vacant houses in the city. Um, and uh, almost uh, about a quarter of the houses that will be demolished will be done in a way where it's actually training unemployed neighborhood residents in basic work skills as a transition to long-term jobs through the deconstruction of these houses, as well as keeping materials out of the landfills as we do that. So uh, that's another, that, there's also a, a, a now a new push to form a, a land bank that will be a much larger scale land bank that will um, be a public-private venture uh, to address some of these properties in a more proactive way. Uh, and also, we are now looking at uh, there are something that's kind of unusual in Indianapolis is that we are about ready to have a tranche of about $500 million of infrastructure funds uh, that are going to be generated from the sale of our publicly owned water utility to a, um, a local gas utility, and it's a trust. And that, that, those funds will, uh, are an opportunity. Uh, we could either use them to pave a lot of roads that need to be paved and not really make a big difference, or we can leverage those into something much larger. And that is the fact that, we, that the Legacy Initiative uh, has been so successful and brought all these new partners to the table suddenly opens up opportunities in those conversations where we can sit down with the Deputy Mayor and the, the head of the Department of Public Works and other civic leaders and say, Let's be creative about how we use this $500 million. Let's leverage that into neighborhood revitalization, not just fixing roads. And let's use that in such a way that we'll bring new partners to the table and take things to a larger scale in these other neighborhoods we didn't talk as much about today. And that's exciting. And, and you know, we start to even have conversations like when it's time to celebrate a major civic event, like in 2020 is the uh, bicentennial of Indianapolis. Uh, maybe core neighborhood revitalization is the way we celebrate that and we're having some great early conversations about that and in a few years hopefully I'll be able to come back and talk to you about that so uh, thank you so much for listening I think we're now we really wanted to spend some time uh, answering any questions you might have so I'll open that up. first before we do that I just want to thank the, the panelists for their participation <laughs> any questions yeah you say that uh, volunteers and neighbors in the neighborhood are deconstructing houses, in other words, demo houses, rather than just knocking them down, you're deconstructing them and recycling the materials? Is that what you're 
That is a new initiative that's, that's going to be kicking off this summer, actually, uh, that, is, uh, that is, is, will be happening, yes. It's, it won't be volunteers. It's actually, uh, it'll be a small nonprofit with a small staff and then a lot of trainees who are recruited from the same neighbor, our sustainable communities neighborhoods that are currently unemployed who will be, it's as a transitional job into other opportunities. That is actually a portion of the, um, the funds I mentioned, the $500 million. A uh, portion of that was planned all along to be used for demolition of abandoned housing. And so the city is actually going to be contracting f uh, with a contractor to manage that overall effort, but a subcontract that the city required to be in there was this work. Yes. Hi, congratulations. That sounds amazing. <laughs> um, oh, thanks. I guess I was sitting right next to the mic. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Oh, great. OK. Um, so uh, my name is Dee Dee Swesnick. I'm with the National Fair Housing Alliance. But I wanted to mention that we just received a grant to open up a fair housing center, which is going to be the Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana. So I'd love to be working with you great. guys on that. Um, and you know, part of the mission of the, the center is to promote integration and fight housing discrimination. So actually, one of the questions I had was you mentioned a lot of residential input. That sounds great. I'm wondering. How did you make part of the legacy project and everything else you're doing just to ensure that residents are able to remain and fight any kind of housing discrimination and gentrification? It's that's actually been um, probably one of the things. If there's a if there's a case to be made, we've we've been overly sensitive to that. If if there is such a thing, um, every step of the way with the with with the housing work that we're doing. Um, We've said we want to err on the side of, uh, we've got a lot of historic preservation people, so we're erring on the side of preservation, and we're erring on the side of preservation of people um, to certainly minimize uh, displacement. And there, with 30 to 40 percent abandoned homes in some of our neighborhood, there's plenty of room for new neighbors to kind of move in. Um, but we're really taking great care to make sure that longtime homeowners are taken care of. There's some property tax fixes that have been made. Uh, um, property taxes are drastically lower going forward in Indiana, and uh, that's, uh, that's part of the thing that, that leads to a lot of gentrification, as you guys know about. Um, but then a lot of the NSP funds, frankly, that we received, um, literally 52% of them in, in some of our neighborhoods um, have that stipulation that you're only serving those at 50% and below of area median income. So again, the, um, uh, that, that has been in the forefront. Uh, the Jefferson Apartments is a good example of that home ownership incubator. Really came out of those quality of life um, discussions where we said, you know what we really want is we want existing renters to say, we'd like to put down roots in this neighborhood. We want to remain in this neighborhood. How do we create kind of a steady stream, frankly, of potential buyers from existing renters? And so the Jefferson Apartments is at least 18 units with neighbors with a stated goal of home ownership that have probably been in substandard uh, rental housing that will start to work toward uh, home ownership. Um, within the neighborhood and we'll start to brainwash them on why they should choose a Near East Side home once they're ready to buy. I think a another thing that um, a mantra that I've heard uh, numerous times so much so many that I actually I'm not sure who first said it but is that the people who are here in the worst of times deserve to be able to be here in the best of times and that really um, runs throughout those folks who have been engaged in this process from the beginning. Mm -hmm. First of all, you guys are doing great work out there, and you should be commended. Uh, you know, uh, Richmond, California, we're kind of like right smack in the middle of Oakland and San Francisco. So we've got the Giants, and we've got the A's, we've got the Niners, and we've got the Raiders, and we've got the Warriors. But i got to tell you, we got no love for any of those guys and no money in our projects. So the first question is, how did you get your sport franchise to the table? That's the first question. And the second question is, we have a capital project in our collaborative that's a community center. Those things don't serve as debt, and they don't have an initial year's operating cost. So how are you funding it, and how are you running it? So do with the sports franchise, and you with the uh, community <laughs> center. OK, w what I can tell you about any effort to host a Super Bowl, uh, it goes without saying you have to have the support of the local franchise owner. Uh, otherwise, again, if they're not speaking up on your behalf in front of of that small and special group, you really have no opportunity at all. You know, additionally, the uh, Colts franchise and, and our owner, Robert Ursay, he actually contributed a million dollars of his own money 
towards the bid effort. And so that speaks volumes about the Colts. And in fact, they are a huge corporate citizen and that they even support things such as the Indiana State High School Football Championships. They host those in Lucas Oil Stadium every year. And there are other numerous uh, activities and events and organizations that they support. So they are a great corporate citizen. Can you get money outside their state? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, no, sir. Well, one thing I can say is that we did not have a uniquely um, close working relationship from community development with the Colts before this effort. Um, it really was, uh, I think, the, the connection to the host committee what is a, a, I think you really have to give credit to the civic leaders who were, including Mr. Ursay, but that were organizing that bid that said, we want to have a long-term benefit to our community beyond, after the Super Bowl's over with. And if we're going to raise all this money and go through all this effort, we want to have something other than just hosting a game. Uh, and so uh, that, that has been where that drive came from, was that kind of spirit and civic le leadership. So and what was your second question? The community center. That's, that's a hard nut for us to crack think, because we just, uh, the ownership uh, entity is, is going to be somebody who doesn't get money because most of the people that are going to be using that center really can't pay a large lease or give a lot towards the uh, operating costs. So how are you funding it yeah. and how are you operating it? Well, I think for um, the John H. Bonner Community Center that was built a few years ago um, was, uh, was about a nine-year initiative of, of saving, of raising funds, new markets tax credits, um, some other investments there, particularly related to the, to the Legacy Center on yes. Tech's campus. Yeah, speaking to that, what I can tell you, uh, uh, the charitable fundraising effort was, was pretty significant. You have the NFL who, uh, per the bid agreement, is made a, and committed to a million dollar contribution towards the effort. Uh, the facility does bear the name Chase Near East Side Legacy Center. Mm. So uh, Chase Indiana, through uh, you know, its foundation efforts, kicked in a million dollars. Then they, we have endowments and entities such as Eli, I'm sorry, Eli Lilly Endowment, uh, United Way, of Central Indiana, uh, who am I missing, Joe? Yeah. The Lumina Foundation. We also have dollars coming from uh, LISC through the Grassroots Field Initiative Program that they do in partnership with the NFL to, to support the installation of a football, a field turf football surface inside of Texas Football Stadium. And so all told from a charitable end, we have $7 million, I do believe, raised. And then we have an another, another $4 million through LISC and New Markets tax credits to cover the cost of the facility. And so now what will happen, this building will actually open before Super Bowl 2012. And so that's, that's automatically a first right there for the NFL for the facility to open. But then many of our key committee leaders will then transfer over and become members of the board of advisors for that facility so they will continue to participate in the fundraising effort to support the operation then when you add the community partnerships with the various organizations that are doing programs within the facility that's what yields that sustainable model yeah no debt plus an operating reserve no sweet debt. and mil million dollar uh, capital maintenance fund thank you other questions Hi, good afternoon. I'm Will Ball with Caterpillar, and congratulations on an extraordinary project. Uh, we've talked a lot today about your model and a lot of the activity that went into the model, but can you talk a little bit about what the success measures are? How do you go about measuring success in a sustainable way as a result of the extraordinary effort you've put in? I'll frame that a little bit and then let others jump in. I mean, ultimately, from LISC's perspective, we look at the way we are measuring success in sustainable communities that I prefer is, is are they implementing their plan and are they actually accomplishing what they said their goals were as a community. Now, I don't get away with just saying that. And so there are other, you know, we are, we are part of a national evaluation effort that LISC is doing and, and looking at those uh, uh, the, sort of the other indicators of success uh, in the community. So I'm going to let other folks talk about kind of maybe both Sarah is kind of taking our point on that particular piece, but also just from the neighborhood and the, and the host committee, I'd be interested in hearing their thoughts on that. From the 
list perspective in terms of uh, evaluation, we're doing um, both a qualitative and a quantitative evaluation in partnership with National LISC. On the qualitative side, um, for over a um, five-year period, um, so once at the end of the three-year Ginny and then for two more years after that, we're doing a series of interviews with stakeholders um, to really capture the perception um, of change uh, with folks. And then also we have a very long list of quantitative in indicators that we're, um, that we're charting over time. As any of you know who um, work in the field of community development, um, we generally don't see change happen in one or two or three years. And so, um, you know, we're really taking the long-term view on this. And that's why even after Great Indian Neighborhoods came to a close, LISC said, you know, we're not stopping here because the quality of life plans, you know, they're still going on for three more years after this. And so we re-upped with those neighborhoods to see them through that quality of life plan. And, you know, we're still in conversation about what happens after that. But um, so that evaluation um, will need to continue. We at least have five years worth. So we, we hope that we will be able to see some results on both the quantitative and qualitative side um, in that five years. But we don't have it right now because we're still in the midst of it. <coughs> I'll just say briefly at the neighborhood level, I mean, I, for us it is implementation of that plan and I think that's our biggest focus. If we can, if we can show progress on each of those 150 initiatives, um, that, that will be great success. I wasn't kidding. Yeah, but, but really, too, for us it, it is, I think we'll be successful if this does become a regular part of the kind of neighborhood fabric. For us, we had a meeting last night that I wasn't able to attend um, where we talked to our neighbors about making our quality of life planning, refreshing our quality of life plan by January of 2012. It'll, it will then have been you know, three or four years old at that point. And again, we'd like to get to the place where this is pretty much uh, how we operate as kind of a, a neighborhood and as sort of a dynamic system. And I think that's really where we want to get to. And just uh, briefly from the host committee's perspective, you know, we've come alongside LISC, the Bonner Center, and all of the organizations on the Near East Side to support the effort and the achievement of the quality of life goals. So I can tell you from my seat, when I see them smiling and happy, you know, I know that progress is being made uh, to that end. One of the things we did work with the Joe and others on the Near East Side to do was to put together uh, for now what we call the legacy project wish, wish list and part of what my job has been is to go back to our donors whom we said we would never approach for another dollar again <laughs> and say you know what oh by the way you know what if you're interested in doing more you know he, here's a wonderful list and it's how, how many items would you say there, there are a couple of hundred projects on there and we said you know what please entertain some of these if you're looking for ways to further expand your involvement relationship and association because one of the things that those companies who committed uh, 25 million dollars towards the execution of the event downtown they'll never be able to say they are a Super Bowl sponsor host committee donor and Super Bowl sponsor two totally different things and so as they've embraced supporting that effort and they see what's being accomplished with the legacy project and saying you know what Let's also do what the host committee and everyone's doing. Let's have, a, have an even greater impact, something we can point at, at, at substantially for years to come. One of the things that is a misconception a lot of people have in Indianapolis is that somehow the NFL is bringing millions and millions and millions of dollars um, to this effort, and that's why so much is happening on the Near East Side. And actually, the NFL is committing $1 million. That, you know, that, that is what is going into this, yet it's $100 million that have come together to help implement this plan. And I think what we've tried to make the case of, and actually one of the things, there's, a, uh, there's not quite enough for everybody, but probably pretty close, of these back out packets, and it kind of gives a sense of the level of civic profile that we've had for the, the legacy initiative. But there's a couple of articles at the back that talk about how, you know, really what this should we should learn from this is it doesn't take a Super Bowl to to make this happen, and that there are we these are mostly resources that we could have tapped into, and you know, and, um, even if there was no Super Bowl happening. So it it just took something like this to galvanize the effort and now we just need to continue it on and replicate that in more neighborhoods as far as the kind of civic partnerships that are there. So uh, I, I think that you know th this, this can be done in any city and certainly in any neighborhood in Indianapolis. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, 
four rolled in from Chicago. I run a free development corporation uh, in the city and had for about 34 years. Uh, <laughs> I think it, this is streaming on the web, so you have to talk into a microphone. Sorry. <laughs> so one of the sort of problems that we have in so many inner city neighborhoods, certainly in Chicago, is Certainly people are financially poor, but it's the poor in spirit. It's, you know, neighborhoods that, uh, you know, have lost control of their economy. You know, you have well-organized, well-capitalized street gangs who have drug enterprises that are seducing children into the drug trade, creating, a, you know, an economy where you have folks running around for, you know, they have $200 a day habits, drug habits that need to be satisfied, and everybody becomes a victim of that. And so in order to improve education, whether charter schools or existing schools, you need to, and be able to te teach children how to read, write, and do math, you know, you, you need to have mechanisms uh, that address uh, spiritually, people's relationship with each other, their relationship with their community, being good neighbors, being kind to each other. So it's not necessarily so much getting people trained and employed as sort of turning on that light, you know, that we're all in this together, and so I'm wondering, that long sort of, this leads to a question, what role did the religious community play uh, in your effort here, if, if it did at all? We have a number of great churches that are very engaged in this work. Every one of those planning meetings that you saw happened in a church basement. <laughs> um, and and, and we've, we've really been blessed by a lot of churches that, that have stepped up to the plate to be a part of this. And I agree with that so much. I think the real trick is, is help turning that light on um, in people's heads or in people's hearts or wherever uh, to essentially look at their lives and look at um, the ways that they're connected to one another. The one thing that I'm most proud of just at, for our neighborhood work is not the many millions, the hundred million dollar number or whatever. It's really just that there's more of a sense now that we are in this together, that, that if one of our neighborhoods or one of our blocks, if something good happens on that block, by extension, it happens good for sort of all of us. And one of the very things that happened early on in the process for us as we had to create that TIF district is that TIF could only encompass three of our 20 neighborhoods, and we had to decide which ones were going to get the goodies. Um, that was that could have been a really, really nasty discussion at the neighborhood level, but it was a real opportunity for us to talk with some of those faith-based partners, community partners, to say, Let's focus these dollars where they're really, really needed most. Let's not put our own self-interest you know, in the forefront here. Let's make decisions based on what's best for everyone and not what's best for one group or one organization. And we've really been pretty dogged about that. And knock on wood, um, it's something that I, I think we're most proud of. I, I, one of the, thing, the pictures that we included in the videos were um, pictures of with uh, Tony Dungy and Peyton Manning and then another picture after that with a lot of kids uh, middle school and high school age kids those pictures were taken at where they announced the fact that Indianapolis was actually going to host the Super Bowl and won the bid and that was in the middle school right in the middle of the neighborhood so I think that that kind of um, recognition and uh, usually the Near East Side has mostly been in the news over uh, murders and things like that you know over the last decade and the fact that now when they're in the newspaper or on, on television it is often for a very positive connection to probably the most popular person and you know in, in Indianapolis right now Peyton Manning is a good person to have in your neighborhood you know and uh, so um, He'd be more popular if we were in the Super Bowl last year, but uh, the uh, it, it is uh, that kind of connection, you know, just as far as the spirit of the neighborhood and recognition and lifting up of that neighborhood, and the fact that the that the um, the football field at the high school in the neighborhood is going to have a, a new turf surface along with this community center is all those things are are important for that as well. So, other questions? I think we have time for one more here. Yes, I think so. So Indianapolis is one of our list sites that's been um, exemplary in integrating green into a lot of the work that you do. So it's not just green around the built environment, but a lot 
around a lot of the community um, activities that you're engaged in. Can you touch a little bit up on that and how you really work to integrate green into your sustainable communities approach? Well, uh, I think I'll let Joe talk a little bit more about some of those things on the Near East side. I mentioned the whole deconstruction initiative. Uh, we, uh, we think that that is a really critical piece um, of linking opportunity with green behavior, uh, which is, is a pretty exciting thing to see happen. Um, one of the other opportunities that we see going forward is this whole infrastructure discussion of whether that's transit or, whether, or how we use our infrastructure. Um, we, we believe that kind of the remaking of our urban neighborhoods uh, depend on uh, being able to have an effective transit system, which we do not have now right, now, right now, and so that, and that urban neighborhoods need to help be advocates and be prepared for that instead of being passively on the sidelines while that's discussed. So that, that's another, as we look forward over the next few years, we think that's an, a critical piece um, and that would help our neighbors to function truly as urban neighborhoods that are not not car dependent anymore. Uh, so I think, uh, Joe, you want to talk a little bit more about some of the specific greening yeah. efforts on the east side? Um, I think uh, my, some of my preservation folks back home would, would chide me to say um, there's nothing greener than preserving an old building um, rather than kind of knocking one down. So I think that in and of itself is, is pretty green. Um, a number of our developments are LEED certified. I think the community center and Tex campus is LEED silver. Uh, a couple of our other buildings are as well, our new health center. Um, we're doing a big tree planting initiative, 2012 trees by 2012, which is a kind of a cool thing. And then probably the biggest thing that I'm actually most excited about is a $9 million grant through the Department of Energy uh, retrofit ramp up grant, which is um, uh, roughly $2 million of micro grants to Near East Side residents and businesses, uh, $1,500 to kind of make weatherization improvements uh, to save energy. Um, I'm so excited about that because that extends a lot of these benefits to a lot of our neighbors mm -hmm. that have participated and will now see some of the benefit of it. And you give neighbors in our neighborhood an extra $750 in their family budget and they will stretch it. They will be green with it. Um, and then there's also um, some low end interest loan component to that same program uh, that will be extended to more of our moderate income homeowners, um, including possibly myself. Um, so just a lot of those things to make our neighborhood very energy efficient and green. That should touch over a thousand residential and small business properties just from that retrofit ramp up grant. And would like, like to add real quickly, the NFL through its environmental programs has what they call an urban forestry component to that of which we anticipate that there will be an additional five to 6,000 trees that will be planted, uh, not only on the Near East Side, but across our entire community, adding to that tree canopy. So that's another one of those positive things that will happen in connection with the event. Well, thank you so much for um, sitting in with us this afternoon.